enterprise. I'm just going to briefly talk to you about some collaborative work that uh, my recent my group has been doing um, with many of you uh, on the on the situation in the region. As we've just heard from uh, Valentina, the 28th meeting of the Mirab network was a great success, and it was a pleasure to talk to you many many of you there, particularly about the importance of uh, surveillance for virus strains, which, as Professor Nell has pointed out, um, has now become much more in the public conscience. Out of that meeting, the, the Mericon network, as we know, has um, is emerging, and subsequent to the meeting, uh, we wanted to help contribute to one of the important steps of the Mericon network, and that is to start building the evidence and fostering collaborations between uh, member countries. And so to that end, uh, colleagues in my research group have been starting to review the epidemiological data with colleagues who attended that meeting, including a post hoc targeted survey of the focal points uh, where possible from the ministries of health, agriculture and institutes of public and animal health from those 12 member states um, that, that were attending the meeting. And the aim really was to compare them with previous um, published reports, um, but also importantly to highlight any missing data um, and some opportunities uh, for the Mericon network as we move forward. First then, uh, it's important just to acknowledge um, all the contributors to this work. Um, most importantly, the country representatives who attended the meeting. And thank you very much for your attentive replies um, to all our requests subsequent to the meeting. I'd also like to um, acknowledge um, Dr. Pico from the Merrier Foundation and colleagues from the Global Alliance um, who've contributed as well. I'll only briefly mention the results here because the um, paper has been accepted for publication and will be coming out um, very shortly, but I just thought I'd give you um, a, a flavor of, of some of the results that we've got. So the first um, major data set that we have is the number of reported animal bites um, in, in the years in question. And as you can see, and as expected, there's a wide range in the number of reported animal bites. Um, and importantly, um, comparing with previous data, six member states were similar, two had increased numbers and, and one fewer compared to, to the last data that we looked at in, in 2014. Moving on to actual reported uh, dog rabies cases, again, there's a wide range across um, the member states. We wanted to investigate whether the number of human rabies cases um, was related to the number of dog rabies, bearing in mind that um, every human case is uh, the consequence of a bite from an infected dog. And indeed, um, as you can see, in this um, plot, there is a relationship, albeit very weak. So as um, the number of uh, dog rabies cases um, on the x-axis increases, the number of human cases um, generally increases. But the um, their relationship is weak. And that what that tells us is that there's a lot of variation in the number of human rabies deaths that can't be uh, explained simply by the number of dog rabies cases. And of course, that would be no surprise to many of us who work in rabies, um, and there's various possible reasons for that. Imperfect surveillance in animals, humans, and both. And it can also be related to the provision and uptake of post-exposure prophylaxis, which will vary from country to country. Um, moving on then to one of the most important indicators, which is of course, um, actual confirmed human rabies cases. Um, and the number of reported cases uh, in this study was equivalent or roughly similar to the um, last Mireb uh, collection of data in 2014. Um, and of course, we can expect that to be a, an underrepresentation of, of the true number of deaths, but it's an important benchmark nonetheless. We did see that the member states that had the highest number of human deaths were also the ones that reported highest dog vaccination coverage. Um, and in the interests of generating evidence to help support advocacy for dog rabies vaccination, this is extremely important. We weren't able to demonstrate a significant quantitative association, um, but nonetheless, the countries that were um, reporting the highest levels of dog vaccination also reported the lowest numbers of human deaths, which is 
um, an important um, finding. Just finally to move on to some of the uh, capacities. Um, so some good news in terms of dog vaccination, dog vaccination coverage or reported dog vaccination coverage has um, increased. Um, we had additional published data compared to in this situation and it's increased from 2014 to 2015 and again to the data that we um, summarised in 2017. Of course, um, as we all know, dog vaccination is key um, to eliminating dog mediated human rabies. So this is um, very good, good news. Um, and then finally, um, we looked at data on human vaccine usage um, and post exposure prophylactic use had actually decreased in six of the states that, that uh, submitted data since um, 2015. And two member states reported human cases despite 100% reported PEP coverage. Again, that's not necessarily surprising because it depends upon um, people's willingness to attend for um, public health treatment and post-exposure prophylaxis. And as um, many of us know, the, the data for rabies immunoglobulin use is limited. Um, and, and so although we did have it for some member states, not all were able to. Um, in the plot on the left, um, we were investigating the relationship between post-exposure prophylaxis uptake and the number of, of animal bites um, to look at that, the ratio between them. And indeed, some countries have a, um, a an, the expected relationship in that the more animal bites um, that are reported, the higher number of post-exposure provision. But it's also clear that there are some um, outliers where there's either high animal bites, but lower PEP provision um, or, or vice versa. And of course, this is again, very dependent on the levels of reporting, but um, these gathering these sorts of data are useful to um, for comparisons and as a benchmark. So clearly um, there's limitations to this study, not least because um, we focused on the 12 members who were able to make the last MIREB meeting. There are other um, many other MIRACON members, but also as we all know, we're dealing with a wide um, geographic and culturally wide uh, base of, of countries in the region. And there's another 18 countries that border um, Mericon members that we weren't able to include. Another one is that these are country level data. And of course, we then miss the heterogeneity, the variation within country, which can be really important. Um, there are the data sources which weren't available, which would really help um, in advocacy and also in um, economic evaluation, and those include um, the cost of post-exposure prophylaxis and dog vaccination, and actually the levels and, and nature of animal rabies surveillance. And of course, we couldn't also um, ascertain the virus variant that was responsible for the cases um, because those data weren't available, um, and that would also um, influence our ability to understand um, the, the epidemiology in, in many of the countries. So just to conclude, uh, what I think the, the important aspect of this is study really is to provide a baseline, demonstrate the um, value of, of data collection, but also to highlight some of the um, important gaps. One of the things that um, has become apparent, not just in this study, but elsewhere, is the availability of dog demographic data um, is very low. And that's important in assisting planning adequate vaccination campaign and campaigns and importantly resource allocation um, and and uh, my colleague um, Emma Taylor who was responsible for um, putting all this work together um, her research is focused on exactly that so trying to incorporate um, dog uh, information on dog demographics and dog data into models of rabies control um, so that we can try and inform um, vaccine coverage plans much more efficiently. Um, there's also a, uh, uh, many regions are, are starting to use an integrated bite case management approach for the provision of post-exposure prophylaxis um, following a bite. Um, and they, um, there's a need really for evidence to support their use because they can be more expensive, but um, in most cases there will be more cost effective per animal and human life saved and therefore um, it's really important for advocacy to generate evidence for those. Um, Professor Nell has already talked about the importance of awareness and education resources, which um, the Miracle Network is perfect for sharing. 
and laboratory training capacities um, comes up again and again. And most of the data that I've talked about are based on clinical diagnosis only. Um, and so um, improved laboratory training capacity are a key area. And finally, um, as we've heard, the, the importance of um, detailed stepwise approach to rabies em elimination assessments um, will help understand the situation when each, when, within each of the Americon member states. So I'd just like to thank again to all the contributors to this um, study, colleagues from GARC and, and the Maria Foundation, and of course my colleagues um, from the University of Surrey in the UK, in particular Emma Taylor, who undertook the work. Thank you very much for your attention.